Good morning everybody, welcome to our Good Friday service. Today we're going to work our way through the crucifixion story from Mark's Gospel, beginning with the trial of Jesus before Pilate and ending with the burial of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea. I'm not going to spend too long preaching today, but we'll share a thought or two on each section and Carolyn will read each section in turn and we will intersperse it with some songs as we go. So first of all, Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 15. Thank you, Carolyn. The reading is from Mark 15, 1 to 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away and turned him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, are you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply and Pilate was amazed. Now it was custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom they have requ the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing that it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with what the one you call the King of the Jews? Pilate asked him. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But then they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed them over to be crucified. So in this passage, Pilate begins the day with an early knock on the door of the Praetorium by members of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. And with them, they have a man who is bound and bleeding from having been punched in the face. The accusation that he is a king. Pilate is a straightforward type of man and his only interest is to keep the peace. And if that means crucifying a few rebellious Jews along the way, well, so be it. He's recently stopped one insurrection and has the prisoners ready to go to the gallows a little bit later on in the day. So one or two more won't hurt. So he asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? In this whole passage, up until the crucifixion, Jesus says only one thing. It is as you say. Other than that, he is silent before his accusers. And this, of course, reminds us of Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Pilate, of course, doesn't know what to make of Jesus' silence. He knows that the accusations of the chief priests are being made out of jealousy. And so he knows that Jesus is innocent of any crime deserving of death. Then it hits him. He can leave it to the crowds to make the decision. Surely they will not want a known zealot, uh, Barabbas, to be released to cause more trouble. However, what he did not bargain for was the power of persuasion and herd mentality. Before long, all those gathered on that morning were calling for the release of Barabbas and the crucifixion of Jesus. Pilate didn't want to risk any further trouble. And so wishing to satisfy the crowd, we're told, Pilate released Barabbas and had Jesus whipped and prepared for crucifixion. Jesus dies as King of the Jews. And Mark leaves us in no doubt about this, as this phrase, King of the Jews, is used six times in this passage. And this was the political reason for his death. His kingdom challenged the power of Rome, and of course, ultimately, in the centuries to come, would overcome it. 
Rome's power, you see, was built on death, and crucifixion was devised as the ultimate deterrent for any would-be rebel. But Jesus did not overcome Roman power through waging war against them. Rather, he overcame the power of death through the resurrection, as we shall see on Sunday. His victory over death broke the stranglehold of human might and is the guarantee of our ultimate victory in life and in death. Finally, we have the real, very real picture of that great exchange that took place. Jesus died in place of Barabbas. He was a substitute for him, the innocent for the guilty. And this is a picture of what he's done for each one of us. He has died in our place. He is our substitute. He has borne our sin on the cross. He is our, uh, the one who has replaced us in that place of penalty. And as a result, we can go through. The penalty for our sin is paid for because he took our place upon the cross. We're going to sing now the passion of the Saviour. And that sums that up in terms of saying that he is our substitute, the guilty for the innocent, the innocent for the guilty. Thank you.
Mark 15, 16 to 21. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then wove a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to shout out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. They then led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. Now we come to this next section, Mark 15, 16 to 21. This ugly scene has been recapitulated many times in history when the soldiers of an occupying force are in possession of a prisoner who is potentially a terrorist and they show no mercy. We could think of Guantanamo Bay in more recent times. These soldiers had no knowledge of who Jesus was. They were not interested in the politics of the Middle East. This was their chance to have a bit of fun and exact some punishment on those troublesome Jews, particularly this one designated King of the Jews. The mockery of these soldiers towards Jesus is typical of humanity, which rejects the rule of God over their lives and instead mocks him. They are men of their time, but also are typical of men, people in all times. However, at this point, another character enters the story, Simon of Cyrene who Mark tells us is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Clearly, Mark expects his audience to know who Alexander and Rufus are. Indeed, Rufus is mentioned in Romans 16 verse 13 and was evidently a leader in the church in Rome, whom Paul calls a choice man in that passage. So Simon, their father, is forced by the Roman soldiers to carry Jesus' crossbeam. This obviously has a deep impact on this North African Jew for him to recount the story of Jesus to his family. In Mark 8.34, Jesus had told his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross or his crossbeam and follow me. And Simon literally does this for Jesus. And it's a picture to us of what it really means to be a disciple. It means being willing to pick up our cross beam, to lay down our life in pursuit of Jesus, to follow him wherever he leads. Go to sing now the song at the cross.
Mark 15, 22 to 32. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes, and they cast lots to see what each one would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among those themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now we come to Mark 15, verses 22 to 32. And Jesus is brought, brought to that place of the skull, the place of execution. The first thing the soldiers do is to try to give him some wine to help dull the pain, but he refuses it because he is determined to drink to the full the cup the Father has given him to drink. Remember in Gethsemane he asked for the cup to be taken away, but then said, not my will, but yours. So now he, he, we see him determined to follow through what he has given, what he has promised to the Father. Stripping him naked, they nail him to the cross and then erected into place. And then they gamble for his clothes. And all this is done with military precision. And Mark doesn't waste words on describing the events. He does, however, draw our attention to the titular, the, the sign that was above Jesus' head to identify the reason for his crucifixion. And he is crucified again for being King of the Jews. There was something else on that sign though. Paul tells us in Colossians 2.14 that your sin and my sins were also nailed on that cross. The punishment for them was meted out on Jesus. And when he died, the accusation against us, our guilt, our sin, our shame, were dealt with once and for all. They were nailed there to the cross. They were on that cross and he has paid the punishment for everything that could have accused us. And then we're told that two bandits were crucified with him as well, one on either side of him. And there were probably men involved in Barabbas's insurrection. In Mark 10, 35 to 40, we heard James and John asking to sit at the left hand and the right hand of Jesus in his glory. And Jesus responded to them by telling them that the occupiers of those seats had already been set by the Father. And we now encounter those for whom such seats were prepared. And we hear the words of Isaiah reiterated as it's written in Isaiah 53, 12. And he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. The vocation of Jesus as our intercessor was typified nowhere more fully than at the crucifixion, where he was in our place, bearing our sin and pleading for us before the Father. Then, as if sending an innocent man, the Son of God, to his death, the priests, it was not enough, the priests and the scribes lead the abuse against Jesus. They hurl his words at him about destroying the temple and rebuilding it again in three days. And the irony is that the temple of his body was in that very moment being destroyed and would indeed be raised up again within three days. We're going to sing again now. How deep the Father's love for us. Give 
father turns his face away as wounds which mother chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my guilt upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was a his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Mark fifteen thirty three to 41 At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Leave him alone now. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry, he said, and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem, were also there. Now we come to Mark 15, verses 33 to 41. And this is the critical three hours between 12 o'clock midday and 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Usually this is the brightest time of the day, but on this particular day everything went dark. And this period culminates with Jesus quoting Psalm 22.1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the whole psalm, Psalm 22, presents the crucifixion and we have already seen verse 18 of it fulfilled in the soldiers gambling for his clothes and verses 7 to 8 fulfilled in the mocking of the priest. And now Jesus utters his cry of dereliction and the deep sense of abandonment he felt as, as he bore the sins of the world upon his shoulders completely and utterly alone comes out of his heart, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in the confusion, some think he's calling for Elijah, as they believed Elijah would come before the Messiah came. 
However, as we saw in chapter 9, verse 12 of Mark's Gospel, the coming of Elijah had already been fulfilled in the person of John the Baptist. According to John 19.30, Jesus then cried out, It is finished. And in that moment of abandonment, he breathed his last and the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And that was the signal that the temple was now redundant, no longer required. The way has been made open for all people to come to God, not on the basis of the blood of bulls and goats, but on the basis of the shed blood of the Saviour. What a privilege you and I have to access the very presence of God, the Holy of Holies. There is no longer a curtain in the way, a veil to separate God from the rest of humanity. There is no longer a need for an earthly priest, as we can all now, we are all now priests and have a high priest in heaven. And we can come, we're told, boldly before the throne of grace and commune with the Lord daily. And that path has been opened up through the body of Jesus as he died on the cross. Next we have the utterance of the centurion. And this man must have seen men die many times. He was a battle-worn soldier, and yet something about this death was different. He observed as Jesus breathed his last and exclaimed, out of his observations, this man was the Son of God. Suddenly he changed from simply doing his job as an executioner to making a proclamation about this dead man that singled him out as something more than a man. Finally, in that scene, we have a description of some of the women at the cross. And notice the disciples are nowhere to be seen, but these women who had been part of the entourage all the way from Galilee were there at the end. How their hearts must have broken as they watched the one in whom was all their hope die. All that remained for them was to ensure that he had a decent burial. I'm going to sing again now, because of your love. Okay. 
Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love I live. Mark 15, 42 to 47. It was preparation day, that is the day before Sabbath. So, uh, so as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave his body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen, linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it up in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Now we come to Mark 15, 42 to 47, the end of the passage. With time running out before the Sabbath, there were actually only three hours left, of course, because the Sabbath began at six o'clock in the evening. So Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the council who had not approved of the conviction of Jesus and who had been a follow, follower of him at a distance, plucked up the courage to go and ask Pilate for Jesus' body so that he could at least give him a decent burial. And we're told in John 19 39 that Nicodemus also helped Joseph in this task. Pilate's a bit surprised at this request. Crucified men could linger between life and death for up to four days, but he was being told that Jesus had died in a matter of a few hours. <coughs> he needed to verify the fact, so he sent for the centurion who had been at the cross to check the facts. And sure enough, the centurion confirmed that it was so. And so Pilate consented to Joseph having the body. And all this toing and froing must have taken some, some of that time, that three hours that they had before they could uh, complete the task. And so by the time Joseph got down, got Jesus down from the cross, it must have been quite late in the day. He only had time to wrap Jesus in the grave shawl and lay him in the tomb, his own tomb according to Matthew. Normally time would have been taken to prepare the body for burial, but this would have to wait until after the Sabbath. Notice verse 47, the women want to know where he's being laid so that they can come back and finish the job properly. And this of course allays the notion that some have proposed that the women simply went to the wrong tomb on Easter Sunday morning. No, they were going to be certain where he had left the body, where the body had been laid so that they could properly prepare his body for burial. And so we're left at the tomb, with the women watching on, and a great stone rolled in front of the tomb. And from Matthew 26, 65 to 66, we're also told that the tomb was sealed and guarded. And again, that allays the other suggestion that his disciples came and stole the body away. For the finish of the story, you're going to have to wait for Sunday the morning of resurrection. But we're just going to conclude with a final song, When I Survey.
joining with us today. Let's pray before we finish. Father, we thank you for all that you achieved for us on the cross. We thank you that in that moment of Jesus' glorification, as he laid out down his life for each one of us, as he poured out his, his blood for each one of us, so Lord God, we give you thanks and we celebrate all that you have achieved. Thank you that you died for us, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you've set us free from sin, guilt and shame. And thank you that we now have access into the presence of the Father. Amen. See you Sunday. God bless.